Well, good morning, church. If you don't know me, my name is AJ. I'm the youth director here at Emmanuel. And I get to uh, give you guys the message for today. And so if you guys have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to John, 1 John, chapter 2, verses 3 to 14. That's 1 John, chapter 2, verses 3 to 14. And if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. You can follow along with the screen. But it starts with verse 3. John says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am right, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. He says again, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity in which your word brings to us, because, Father, life is messy. Life is hard to navigate through. Sometimes we get so involved with with the obstacles in life, with problems in life, that we forget that you are light. You help us see. You help us through these problems. You help us and you guide us through living like your son. And so, Father, as we continue to uh, dive deep into your word, I pray, convict us with your Holy Spirit and help us understand how to be who you called us to be. In your mighty name, amen. Now, after having read this passage, the question I would like to ask for you today is, what is the church? What is the church? You think about it for a moment. Because if you've just been coming to church, and, and uh, many of us could be doing this for a very long time, we, we sometimes forget some of the most basic things, like what the church is. What is the essence of the church? Because having read this passage and and, uh, chapter one, which you guys have went through with Todd last week, one thing is clear to me about John. When he writes his epistle, one thing is very clear, and that is he cares for the church. And if John cares for the church, how much more does God? John cares for the church. So what is it? It's a good question. One of the things that I love to do when I'm on vacation is I like to look around and admire wherever I go what churches are like elsewhere in the world. A couple of weeks ago, Faith and I, uh, we went on a road trip for our anniversary down to California. And on the road, I got to see so many different churches, churches big and small, 
right? It's like the coconut song. It's like of every size and every color and every, every kind of shape. You had churches adorned with Christian symbols, huge crosses at the top, on the front, on the hill of the, of the property. You had churches that were so unassuming that if you didn't look at a map, you wouldn't know it was even there, that it was even a church. And yet, if you've been a Christian for a while, you would know that the church is not the building. Church is a people. In fact, the word church we get from uh, the Greek word ecclesia. And ecclesia is translated literally into a gathering of people, an assembly of people. What we're doing right now, we're gathered, we're assembled. This is what you can call a church. And yet, is that all there is to what being the church? Is it just to gather together? What makes us different from a chess club? What makes us different from a riot or a mob or a yacht club? I think we know what makes us different from a yacht club. <laughs> no, there's something about the church that's different. It's more than just us coming together. And John has a word about that. When we ask what the church is, what, we're asking what do the people look like? How do the people behave? How does this group in particular set themselves apart from other groups in the world? We read through the ch uh, chapter two of John and we see in verse three, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Oh, that's harsh. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is who, how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now John reminds us that the church is a people who knows God through their obedience. The church is a people who knows God through their obedience. Obedience to what? So it sort of implies that we also know the commands of God. But more than that, more than just knowledge, more than just Bible study, he says that the church is a people that knows God through their obedience. Verses three to six, it's a callback to Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, where Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by the Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now this is a beautiful, beautiful passage because we know that God loves us. We know that we sing about it. Well, I mean, that's why we sing, is because we don't deserve his love and yet he pours it onto us through the ultimate act of sacrifice on the cross. We know that God loves us. But here Jesus is turning the tables and he says, well, now if you love me, this is what you would do. See, I loved you, and, and this is what I've done for you. But if you truly love me, then you would follow my commands. It's so simple, but sometimes the simplest things can also be the hardest things. The church is a people that knows God through their obedience, that loves God through their obedience. What's freeing is that if you remember last week, the passage that you guys went through in chapter 1 of 1 John, he says in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not with us. What is John saying there in conjunction to what he's saying in chapter 2? He's saying that it's not about moral perfection. Okay, and, and everyone can just let out a sigh. It's not about being perfect. It's not about living the perfect life. Jesus did that. However, it is about obedience. One of the best things you can do with a child, and I've seen this, I've seen this done many times, is when they've made a mistake, you go and tell them, you know, if you've made this mistake, you come and tell me, and I won't be angry, right? You're putting the emphasis on the confession. And countless times I've seen the expression on kids' faces where they go from fear and guilt and shame into humility, into processing what you have invited them into and repenting. Does that mean there's no discipline for the child? Does that mean there's no consequences for their actions? No, but it allows them to see that moral perfection is not the expectation, but it's obedience. This means that, try as I might, to live a holy and righteous life before God. When I make a mistake, when I fail, when I stumble, my next step is then to go on my knees and ask for forgiveness. Because that's the next step into love and obedience towards God. John is saying moral perfection is not the expectation, but obedience is. Can you continue, despite your mistakes, to obey God, to know him, and to love him through your obedience? The church is a people who knows God through their obedience. We move along in verse 7. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new commandment, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Now, I was reading this and, and I had to I really had to take a pause because I was trying to figure out what John was saying. He says, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one. Yet I am writing you a new command. And so I, I got stuck and I was like, okay, John, what are you talking about? I know this is translated from Greek, but it can't be so confusing that after 2,000 years of study, people are still writing this passage this way. I'm reading this and I, I come to realize that the new command that is old, but is actually new, as John is confusingly saying in verses seven and eight, is a reference to what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34. It's Jesus who says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what John is saying is that this command is old because you, the, the readers of this letter would have received the gospel long before they received this new letter from John. And so it's old, but it's new because that's what Jesus calls it. It's a new command. But it's also new in, this, in the fact that since having made this command, Jesus goes on to do what? To show us how he loves us by dying on the cross for us. 
And so what John is saying here is that we're given an update to the meaning of love one another as Jesus has loved us. What John is saying is that a church is a people who loves one another like Jesus loves us. I'm saying that a lot because there's power in repetition. There's emphasis in repetition. It's another simple concept that in practice I realize is hard for many of us to do. Now, church, we're going to do an exercise. It's going to be a little bit fun for me, maybe a little bit uncomfortable for you. But what I want you guys to do, you don't have to get up, but we're going to do a survey of the people around us in this room. Okay, and so for a moment, I'm going to invite you, just, you might have to twist, you might have to pivot or turn, but look at the people around you in this room, in this sanctuary. Go ahead, turn your heads, look beyond your family members or your friends that are sitting right next to you, yeah? If you, if you meet eyes with somebody, don't break it. Have a little staring contest, right? Give each other a good look. Now, tell me, when you look at the other people in this room, and then you read this passage that a church loves one another as Jesus loves us, do you love the people in this room the way that Jesus loves you? Now, it's interesting, right? Because the first part of this passage, we're, we're talking about, do you love Jesus as much as he loves you? Are you willing to give your life to him in the same way that he has given his life to you already? And then the next step is, well, the church is also a place of people where people love one another as much as Jesus loves them. Can we do that? Is that something we can honestly say is a reality in Emmanuel? Do we love one another as Jesus loves us? Do we pray together or for one another? That's what I love so much about the prayer wall, and I'm glad that Kyle mentioned it, is because it allows us to actively show that we're actually praying with one another. Sometimes we throw a prayer request out there and then it's like you, you throw it into the wind. You don't know, right? And some people really might be praying for you and that's, that's incredible and it's encouraging. But to see it physically, that people care and are paying attention to the things that are going through in your life that they're praying for you is another thing. Do we serve one another? It was great to hear that yesterday we had a group of folks in our church that came and, and, and beautified the church parking lot or uh, the church property. But more than that, do we serve one another beyond just what we do in here? Throughout the week, when someone needs help, are there, are there people in our church family that answers the call? Do we encourage one another constantly and rebuke one another when appropriate? I was very, I, I feel very blessed to be staff, to be a staff here at Emmanuel. Because while every church has its own problems and its own weaknesses, I'm still always encouraged by the love that prevails within this group. I, I've talked about the, the group of people who came here yesterday for the worker bee. I've talked about the people who pray, actively pray in our prayer chain and, and, and on the wall. Even a couple of months ago, if you guys remember, our elders held a sort of forum regarding the leadership structure changes that our church is going through. And historically, it's a very hot button issue, right? People get heated in, this, in these kinds of uh, conversations. And yet I was so encouraged coming out of that 
Because not only were the conversations uh, constructive, but it felt like everyone just wanted to do and follow God best. Nobody rolled over another person. Nobody demeaned another person. It was just this amazing thing that even in the heat of what could be called a conflict, we still care for one another. It's great because I can feel the love that we have for one another, and that's essential for, uh, to being a church. When the church loves one another like Jesus loves them, it doesn't matter where they gather or how many people gather. I remember uh, more than 10 years ago now, the first mission trip I ever went to was, was to Ethiopia. And Protestants in Ethiopia are the minority, okay? So there's the Orthodox Church, which is the majority, and, and they don't like Protestants. And then there were Muslims in, in that country that uh, built up the, the second majority. They don't like Protestants in that country. And so the, the churches would meet outside, in the rain, in the mud, under tarpaulin, praising God in the wilderness. And for us, maybe that's something that it's like, okay, well, maybe I can skip that day. Maybe wait for, for a nicer weather. And yet, me witnessing that, when a church loves one another and comes together in that way, it becomes magnetic. People want to be a part of that. People want to know what it's about. A church is a people who love one another like Christ loves us, through sacrifice, through serving, through praying, through encouragement, and sometimes rebuke. Now over the past half year, Emmanuel has taken the task to discern God's vision for our church. One of the exercises, if, if you guys remember, that we've done together was we did a survey online talking about how we feel about Emmanuel. And I love this because it, it, it sort of comes in line with what we're talking about today. What is your vision for the church? What do you want to see out of the church? What do you think the church is supposed to do? Are we a spiritual hospital? Are we a place where people can come in weary, broken down by the world and leave refreshed and spiritually nurtured? I, I was part of a church plant that, that operated in this way. People would come broken from their own church, uh, from, from having their own church history and, and whatever. They come in and then they leave. It was like a revolving door. They leave refreshed, having it reignited this this love and passion for Jesus. And the church never grew beyond 20. Are we, are we a church that's more like a recreation center where people have programs and people come in and, and it's just a place for the community to hang out? Jewish synagogues acted this way. It, they weren't just a place of worship, but they were a place where people would have meals together, spend time together throughout the week. They would have birthdays and other celebrations together in, in the synagogue. Are we aspiring to be that kind of church? Whatever the vision of our church is going to be, one thing, one truth prevails through it all. And it's something that John, uh, throughout his letter, is it, this idea is just dripping because it's so saturated. Whatever the vision of the church is going to be, moving forward, it has to be a family. The church is a family. It's essentially a family. I was blessed growing up because, uh, if you don't know, I'm Filipino, right? And if you've ever been to a Filipino church, you would know this already. But uh, growing up, every adult 
was an uncle or aunt, right? I would just call them Tito, which means uncle. I would call them Tita, which means auntie. Every older person that isn't an adult, I would call them Ate or Kuya, which means uh, big sister or big brother. And it was great because I didn't have to remember any names. Right? <laughs> and people who just came there the first time, they feel so welcomed. I just called them family. It was amazing. It's convenient in that way, but it's also very, very biblical. I, I did this little, uh, this little scan through the New Testament this past week. It became laborious. The amount of times the church or believers, not blood-related, are referred to in familial terms, like brothers or sisters or children, fathers. However, the amount of times the New Testament refers to the church or other believers in familial terms is over 400 times. That's more times it's called, that's more times than it is called the church, the people of God. It's called a family. Even this passage that we're reading right now, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. The way John addresses the family of God is in three groups here. Children, fathers, and young men. It's important to note that John is not exclusively writing to men and little children, which means, ladies, you don't, you don't get a pass, you don't get to wag your, your finger at, uh, at your sons or husbands. But he's writing in a style common for his time, which refers to the group in the masculine. Similar to the way that saying, hey guys, which I'm guilty of doing oftentimes, it refers to both men, women, or a mix of group of people. He's been doing this throughout the whole letter. When he talks about brothers and sisters, it's one word. It's Adelphos. All the same, John addresses the family in these three groups. Children, fathers, and young men. And about children, he says, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He then writes again, uh, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. Here, I don't believe John is exclusively writing about those who are spiritually or physically young. I think John, in chapter 2 especially, as he begins the chapter addressing the whole church as children. He's referring to what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 to 5, when he's asked, who is the greatest in heaven? Jesus says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such a child in my name welcomes me. John is reminding us that no matter how experienced, no matter how accomplished, no matter how mature or even holy we become as Christians, we are still God's children. That the greatest in heaven is one with the humility to say, not by might, not by power, not by my riches or status, not by how much I know or how well I have lived, but by the Spirit of God who provides me with grace, love, and mercy that I could never afford. What's ironic, and I think you guys uh, uh, know this, is that oftentimes the ones who need this reminder are the ones who think that they need this reminder the least. That we are children. That we don't come as believers in this world with a holier-than-thou attitude, but rather we realize that it is a gift, that we have been forgiven on account of his name, not by how great we are, but by how great Jesus is, despite us.
John describes the parents in the family of God, those of greater experience and maturity in the faith. He says, I am writing to you fathers because you know who has been from the beginning. John repeats verbatim what he writes about the fathers, and this is important because whenever the Bible repeats a phrase, it's not simply waxing poetic or, or trying to fluff up a word count. It's because he, uh, the Bible is trying to emphasize a point. All throughout the letter, John is writing about theology and commands. And the one tasked with making sure that the torch or the baton of Jesus' teachings are passed along are the parents of the family. Because you know him who has been from the beginning, because you know him the longest, the most experienced in the faith, you are tasked, parents of the church, you are tasked with discipleship and mentorship. I remember when, uh, so Faith and I mentioned to you guys, we went on a road trip, and uh, one of our stops was the San Diego Zoo, right? And we went on this tram, and, and it was interesting because I got to see all different kinds of animals, uh, one of which was a giraffe. In fact, it was a baby giraffe. It wasn't, it was probably less than a week old, the guide told us. Oh, my, oh three weeks. Three months? That's not true. I disagree. <laughs> we heard differently, although I'm a terrible listener. But it's like a baby, right? We still call that a baby. You go to, you go to a human baby, it's three months old, still a baby, right? <laughs> and so I see this baby, and he's just strutting around, and he's hanging out like, like a real giraffe, you know? By comparison, like human babies, they just lounge around and do nothing, right? <laughs> And so it was amazing, I was listening to this tour guide, he was saying to us, like, all this, all this baby does in growing is, is it observes the herd, and it just figures it out. Just observes the herd, and it just figures how to be a giraffe out. That's amazing. I did more research, a simple Google search, <laughs> and I saw that within an hour of being born, a giraffe is already able to stand on its own and walk. Crazy. And yet, what's amazing also is that in the church, oftentimes when we think about discipleship or whatever, when a new believer comes along, we sometimes treat them like baby giraffes. Right? Like they were born six feet tall already. Like they could stand on their own. Like they, they can walk and be a, a Christian just by observing the rest of us. And yet the reality is, as parents in the church, you're the leaders, you're the elders. We're not giraffes. Right? We're not sea turtles. Oh my gosh, sea turtles, they just leave, they bury their kids and they leave them and then they have to find their own way into the ocean. Call that the Billy Graham approach. I'm just kidding, it's before my time. I don't know what he does. But we often think of discipleship in that way. Ah, as long as they're in the church, it's fine. No, it needs to be more hands-on. If the church is a family, then our family history stretches 5,000 plus years. And it's well documented. And we need the elders, the parents of the church to be able to pass that along because what John describes next, the young men, the youth, the spiritually young in the church, they're the ones with strength to overcome the evil one. They're the ones with potential. You know, I, I hear potential. It, it's, it's the same from those who are physically young to those who are spiritually young. They just have this hunger and desire for God that, that is amazing to see. And they have the strength for it. Because what's true in the physically young is true in the spiritually young. They have this promise to dream and the ability to fulfill it. The same way that I hear grads talking about how they want to be doctors and engineers and, 
and, and what's the other one? Lawyer, I guess. That's the other high-ranking jobs out there. It's amazing because they can actually do it. But I also hear the same way for those who are spiritually young, how they want to see their families, their neighbors, their friends, strangers on the bus come to know and have a saving faith with Jesus. We are a family, the church is, that's supposed to help one another, nurture one another, and be together unified in that way. John says the church is a family that loves each other just as Jesus loved us. A family that knows and loves God through its obedience. And the theme for the series that we have going through the book of John, 1 John, is prove it. And so my invitation to us is, can we be the church that John, that God envisions us to be? Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you because we know that by our strength alone, we are not enough. And yet through you, there's just so much potential. Revival is around the corner. Salvation for families and friends. Growing deeper with you is just around the corner. And so Father, I pray, draw near to us as we draw near to you, being as a family who loves you and knows you through obedience and who loves one another as much as you love us. In your mighty name, amen.